Good evening. If you would open with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 17. 1 Samuel 17. And this is the story, the context where we find David and Goliath. And when you read through this context, I don't know how anyone can read through this and not feel inspired, not feel motivated, not feel uplifted. Because as you read through this story, you find that it's a story of overcoming. It's a story about belief. It's a story about defying odds. It's a story of victory. And ultimately, all that through faith. This story is a wonderful story. It's a rich story for many reasons. It's, it's rich because it's a part of Israel's history. It's rich because it deals with some very important characteristics of David. And it's also rich because when you look to it, and you don't even have to look that hard, you can find some very applicable spiritual applications. And that's what we want to do tonight, very simply. Uh, because it is our VBS evening, our time is very limited. Uh, I have three points for you tonight, just some uh, simple points here from 1 Samuel 17, but I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them. But uh, nonetheless, we've entitled our lesson as tonight's Simple Lessons from David and Goliath. Simple Lessons from David and Goliath. The first lesson I want us to take here from 1 Samuel 17 is, number one, this world can be intimidating. This world can be intimidating. I want you to look with me in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 17, and let's read together verses 4 through 11, because here we're going to see the giant, we're going to see Goliath, and how he was quite intimidating indeed. Again, 1 Samuel 17, let's read verses 4 through 11. The Bible says, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And uh, you, the servants of Saul, choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Then Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, friends, as we go through here, uh, again, what we're seeing here is uh, someone who is quite intimidating. We see here Goliath. He was a, a Philistine giant, and he was, I think perhaps the best way to put it, a monster. <laughs> he stood taller than everyone else. He was bigger than everyone else. He was stronger than everyone else. And he was also more experienced than everyone else. You look to uh, chapter 17 and verse 33, and, and Saul is telling David there that you cannot fight him because you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And so he not only looks intimidating, physically speaking, but he's also a man of great military prowess. He has experience as well. And so he is, uh, again, intimidating in, in every single way. But... Friends, when we think about this, I think we can apply it to our lives as well. You know, Israel was afraid of him. They were intimidated. They were dismayed. In fact, you find out later on that whenever they saw him, they, they fled. They, they ran away. And really, when you think about it, can you blame them? <laughs> I mean, who would want to fight someone like this? Who would want to fight and stand against a man of this experience, a man of this, of this valor? A man who was uh, this strong and, and big and mighty as he was. But friends, as we think about this and apply this to our own lives, I think we find within this context some, some very deep and great spiritual value. Because we ourselves, we face giants often all the time. And they come in various forms. You know, sometimes we face the giant of 
You know, money loss. Sometimes it comes in the form of funerals. Sometimes it comes in the form of medical diagnosis, continued illness, pain. The list goes on and on. And I know that there are many of this congregation who are dealing with things like this. We face those kinds of giants. Sometimes the world throws those kinds of things at us. But friends, even though that's the case, I want us to remember a few things. I want us to remember, first of all, number one, though the giant lingered, though the giant lingered, though he was there day and night, and that's actually what 1 Samuel 17 and verse 16 tells us. He was there morning and evening, day and night, 40 days and 40 nights. He was there constantly. And sometimes it feels like our giants are there constantly. Those money issues, that medical diagnosis, they're there haunting us, taunting us. They're there intimidating us, filling us with fear and dismay. But I want you to remember, friends, that even though, even though the giant lingers, understand that ultimately in the end, the giant was overcome. We know the story. We know how David, just a, a young shepherd boy, he took a sling and a rock and he overcame this giant. But friends, the same conclusion, the same ending of this story in 1 Samuel 17 is the same ending that we as New Testament Christians have as well. In the end, our giants, no matter what form they come in, they will be overcome. They will be slain. They will be conquered. First, John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 tells us that fact that the world is passing away in the lust thereof. And friends, that includes the giants. That includes the difficulties that we face in life. They may feel difficult. They may feel unconquerable. They may feel like they are constantly surrounding us and mocking us and feel like they're never going to leave. But friends, we have this assurance that ultimately, in the end, the giant is defeated. And that is a truth that we find here in 1 Samuel 17 that we can also apply to our lives as well. Remember this also. A second truth that we can take from this as well is that even though, again, the giant lingers, how do we ultimately overcome this giant? How do we wait him out? Ultimately, friends, the answer is faith. That is the answer. That is how David overcame the giant, and that is how ultimately we will gain the victory as well. If you remember 1 John uh, chapter 5 and verse 4, the Bible tells us that very fact, that faith is the victory that overcomes the world. That was the only way, that was the only possible way that David was able to defeat that giant. It wasn't because of his own flesh. It wasn't because of his own sling skills. It wasn't because of anything like that. It was because he fought with God. It was because the battle was the Lord's. And friends, no matter what battle you're facing, no matter what giant you are going against, and we are all facing a giant, we're all facing something that is intimidating and fills us with dismay and dread. But nonetheless, my friends, remember that this is how we will gain the victory. It is through faith in God. Remember, remember 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 9. Remember Peter tells us receiving the end of our faith, that is the salvation of our souls. We will overcome the giant. The same conclusion for David is the same for us. We just have to make sure we endure in faith and we will receive the end of that faith, the salvation of our souls. Another thing I want us to remember is that Israel's problem and oftentimes our problem is the fact that oftentimes we often use our sight too much, if you will. <laughs> we walk by sight. But friends, as New Testament Christians, we have to, we have to walk a different path. We have to choose a, a different way. See, that was the problem with Israel, sight. They were focused on how big Goliath was. They were focused on, on how intimidating and how experienced this, this man of war was. And it was because of that that they fled. 1 Samuel 17, 24 says, When they saw him, they fled. That was their problem. They were walking by sight. But you know, when you read through this context, I find it so uh, encouraging. I find it so uh, motivating when you see the attitude of David. David, when you look throughout this context, he was the only one out of all of Israel, out of all of these experienced military men who stood in the face of this giant, and he, would, he stood unwavered. He was like a rock. He didn't move. He was not intimidated in the slightest. And friends, he overcame the giant. Why? Because his eyes were not on the giant. 
His eyes were on something much bigger. His eyes were on something much stronger. His eyes were on something much more powerful. He had his eyes on God rather than the giant. And friends, that was how he overcame. That was Israel's problem. <laughs> they were walking by sight. And because of that, they were quaking in their boots. And friends, if we, if we do that same thing, if we focus on how deep these money problems are, if we focus on how terrible this, this diagnosis is, if we focus on how discouraging this, this funeral, if you will, is, and I'm not saying these aren't. These are terrible things that we face in life. But if that's all we focus on, if that's all our, our sight is fixed on, yeah, we're going to be discouraged. We're going to be filled with fear, with dismay. But friends, I want us to understand that this life is so much easier to endure when we walk by faith rather than by sight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. I believe we only have time for one more point. And so uh, the second thing I want us to note here from 1 Samuel 17 is that God delights in the simple. God delights in the simple. Think with me for a moment just about David. David, compared to Goliath from a physical standpoint, he was nothing. He was absolutely nothing. Verse 14 tells us he was the youngest of all of his brothers out of eight brothers. Uh, verse uh, 15 tells us that he was just a shepherd boy. Uh, verse 17 and 18 tells us that the only reason he was there in the barracks with the rest of the soldiers was because he was there to deliver food for his brothers from his father. He was just an errand boy. We could also add on top of that that he had no prior military experience whatsoever, probably had never even picked up a sword before in his life, at least to, to fight anyone in a, in a military setting. He was, he was nothing, absolutely nothing uh, compared to Goliath. He was just a little shepherd boy. And friends, when we think about ourselves, when we think about our state, our lowly state as human beings, as flesh, the truth is we're, we're really not much either. We're not the most powerful. We're not the richest. We're not the wisest. We're not the strongest. And that is a fact that even though that is the case, we must understand that that is something that God delights in. He delights in the simple. In fact, if I could uh, steal a verse from Brother Ken that he used this morning, he mentioned Psalm 138 and verse 6, in which the Bible says that though the Lord is on high, yet He regards the lowly. The Lord delights in the simple. If you would, look with me in your Bibles. This will be the last context that we'll look at together in this evening. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's read verses 26 and 27. When you read these verses... I don't see any way how, how you can't compare it to David. Notice with me here what the Bible says. Again, God delights in the simple. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's read verses 26 and 27. The Bible says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Notice verse 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame that which is mighty. You know, when you think about David, that's 100% ex that's exactly what David did. He was just a little shepherd boy. He was nothing compared to Goliath. But yet God put to shame the mighty through that which was weak. And the same exact thing applies to us. We're nothing according to the flesh. We're not kings, we're not princes, we're not presidents, we're not nobility, we're not mighty, we're not strong. We're just flesh. And we ought not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. But the Bible does tell us that we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Romans chapter 8 and verse 37. Again, let's not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Remember, we are just flesh. But any victory, any greatness that we have, it comes from God. If you notice with me here, still in 1 Corinthians, notice here in verse 29, it says that no flesh should glory in His presence. And in fact, to borrow a little more from what Ken mentioned this morning, you know, Ken mentioned from the Psalms you know, how you know, people trust in different things. Uh, he went through the Psalms and he mentioned how people trust in their riches. They trust in the sword. They trust in the bow. He looked at the New Testament and Paul tells the brethren not to trust in themselves. And friends, again, let's not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Again, we're just flesh. And so God deserves all the glory. 
And that's why we can conclude with the words of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 31. Here, still in that context, it says, As it is written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Again, God delights in the simple. And He gives us just simple flesh. He gives us the ability to be conquerors. He gives us the ability to be kings and princes. And He gives us the ability to be His sons and His daughters. We don't attain that through ourselves, through our own means. We attain it through Him. Therefore, if we're going to glory, let, it, let us glory in the Lord. There are a lot of lessons that we can take from 1 Samuel 17, many of which we were not able to get to tonight. Perhaps the greatest lesson that we can learn from 1 Samuel 17 is to develop an unwavering faith like David's. He realized, he understood that he didn't need sword or bow or armor or anything like that. He knew the battle was the Lord's. And likewise, my friends, to use the words of Hebrews 13 and verse 5, let's be content with those things that we have. We don't need to trust in riches. We don't need to trust in anything, especially not ourselves, because we will fail. We ought to trust in the Lord, because that is where the victory lies. That's how we will overcome our giants. That's how we will ultimately overcome this world. Faith is the victory that overcomes this world. If there's anyone here tonight who perhaps you've not been walking in faith, perhaps you've not been living as you ought, friends, I want to extend to you the Lord's invitation tonight. If you have a need to put on the Lord in baptism, I hope that you'll consider doing that this evening. Tonight is the night to do that. If there's any here who uh, perhaps you have obeyed the gospel, but you've not been walking as you ought, you've not been walking truly in faith, you've been trusting yourself and not the Lord Friends, tonight, let's start by trusting in the Lord. Remember, we're not going to get anywhere if we're trusting in ourselves or in any physical thing. If we glory, let's glory in the Lord. If anyone has any need this evening, please let it be known as we stand and as we sing.